Hi everyone, um, today we're going to be looking at Bowlby's theory of maternal deprivation and the first thing to be aware of here is that we're talking about a second theory of Bowlby's. So the first theory you would have learned about and there's a video on is Bowlby's monotropic theory. This theory is about Bowlby's theory of maternal deprivation. They are separate things, although they do relate to each other. So it's very important that you're confident on Bowlby's monotropic theory before you look at this. So make sure you go back and watch that video if you're not sure, and then come back and look at maternal deprivation. So you need to know the difference for the exam and you need to be confident on whether it's asking you about deprivation or about monotropy. So make sure you read the questions really carefully so you're confident on what it's talking about. Both the theories do overlap because they're both by Bowlby, so that's why it's really important to know the differences as well. So today we're going to be looking at the differences between separation and deprivation and describing the effects deprivation has on a child's development. We're also going to look more deeply into maternal deprivation as a theory and we're going to have a quick look at evaluating it, so the strengths and the weaknesses of the theory. So the first thing to do is think about what is the difference between separation and deprivation. You might want to pause the video and just have a quick think. So hopefully you should have said that separation is when a child attachment figure isn't present because of a situation. For example, the child or the mother might be taken into hospital and this normally occurs but when that happens, the substitute caregiver is there. So that could be another parent, a grandparent, an auntie, an uncle, etc. So it doesn't have a significant impact on development because the child is still being provided with emotional care. Deprivation, on the other hand, means the child loses the emotional care. For example, their child might be taken away from the parent because they're unable to cope. And this has an impact on the development of the child because they're not receiving the emotional care. Now, it's really important that you recognise that separation and deprivation are different. However, if we have extended or long periods of separation, this can lead to deprivation and in turn lead to serious harm for the child. So, in order to make sure you're familiar with that, read through in a second Leon and Sophie's scenarios and identify which are suffering from deprivation and which are suffering from separation. And I want you to justify your decisions. What bits of that scenario show evidence for separation or deprivation? And then maybe have a think about why would psychologists argue that deprivation is worse? So, pause the video and have a think. So hopefully you should be able to identify that Leon is suffering from deprivation and this is because he has been removed from his primary caregiver and therefore is not receiving any emotional care. There is no other caregiver that is being provided for him that is giving him the emotional support because staff aren't interacting with him very much and he's often left alone with nothing to do. Whereas Sophie is showing separation because although her mother is in hospital, so she's not getting her primary caregiving support, she has got her grandparents as secondary caregivers who are providing her with love and care because they take her to museums and galleries and they talk to her all the time and they love spending time with her. So she's still getting emotional care. And therefore for Sophie, she is, although it might be a tricky time in her life, she knows that she is supported by her grandparents and therefore she will always be supported. Whereas Leon is learning that actually he has no one and no one is there to support him. And that can have a massive impact on how he deals with later life. The theory of maternal deprivation then focuses on the early experiences that impact on the formation of an attachment. And this is really important because Bowlby talked about the critical period being around two years, so not to two years. And so we're talking about really early on in life having a negative impact on later life and how they cope in adulthood. And he used the term maternal deprivation to refer to long term separation or loss of emotional care. So we're getting, again, the idea of emotional care being stripped away from them. And as well, we said, although it's normally the mother that is the primary caregiver, it can be the, any other mother substitute, for example, the father or auntie or uncle. If this attachment is broken or disrupted, 
in the critical period, so as we said, around two years, the child is going to suffer from irreversible damage, according to Bowlby. So he said if you're anywhere up to two years and you experience deprivation, this is going to have a massive impact on later childhood and adulthood. And this risk does continue all the way up until the age of five. So we remember we're moving away from a critical period into a sensitive period. And he proposed that this continuous loss can lead to emotional and intellectual problems. Emotional problems are just not being able to regulate your emotions, for example, getting very angry all the time, or the opposite by not showing any emotions towards anyone. And later on, we look at Bowlby's theory, uh, Bowlby's study, where he shows about, he talks about um, psychopathy, and that's kind of linked to a lack of emotions. But it also has an impact on your intellectual development. If you're not being um, interacted with or not learning at the same pace as everybody else, normally when a parent plays with a child, they're also teaching them about life. What does that sa what sound does this make? What colour is that? What's this called? But if you're not having that engagement with a child, then that child isn't learning at the same pace as everyone else. And that means that they're going to be affected and going to be behind their whole childhood and their whole education which is really important and can have a massive impact. So looking at the scenario on the right about Abdul I want you to identify the examples that show that he's that he's experienced deprivation and how that relates to the theory of maternal deprivation. You might want to as well have a go at the six mark question about how this links to Bowlby's theory of maternal deprivation. So pause the video and have a think. So probably what you should have said is that Abdul's parents are passed away in a car accident, which means that he has a lack of a primary caregiver. And this happened when he was six months old. So this has happened in the critical period of his life. And this means that it's going to have a long term effect on how he behaves because he's not receiving emotional care. And in this case, it's obvious that he's not receiving emotional care because although he was clothed and fed and given basic that he, his basic needs were fulfilled. The staff aren't interacting with him, so he isn't building a rapport or a scheme of how relationships should be. So again, that's talking about the internal working model and a lack of effective internal working model. He doesn't know how to behave because he doesn't have the um, schema for how he should behave with other people because he's not getting that from staff. He is adopted at five years old and he's struggling. He's showing behavioural problems, he's aggressive and he gets into trouble at school. And this is showing that he's having a, is having a real negative effect on his emotional development. But it's also having an impact on his um, intellectual development because he's not understanding the work and that's why he's getting into trouble at school. And that's because, as Bobby says, if you're not getting the emotional care as a child, that has an impact later on in childhood was suffering from intellectual abnormalities. So if you're going to put this into a six mark, you need to pick out three key bits from the, from the scenario on the right hand side. And any of the ones we talked about would have been fine. You then need to apply each of these individually to how they apply to Bowlby's maternal deprivation theory, making sure to use key terms like the critical period, deprivation, emotional care, and making sure that you clearly refer to each bit in the scenario. So you would normally lay it out with um, the given example from Abdul and his scenario and then explain how that links to maternal deprivation using any appropriate key terms and then repeat that process. So the next thing you need to know is Bowlby's 44 Thieves study. And this was to support the evidence of maternal deprivation. So what he did was he wanted to look at the link between affectionist psychopathy and maternal deprivation. And this affectionist psychopathy can be characterised as a lack of affection, no, not showing guilt and a lack of empathy towards anyone. And he wanted to know whether that was linked with having a period of maternal deprivation in their lives, particularly in the critical period. So he got 44 criminal teens who are accused of stealing and he interviewed them and their parents or, that, or fa other family members in order to find out whether they'd had any kind of deprivation in early childhood and whether they showed signs of affectionate psychopathy. 
It's important that he wasn't trying to label children as psychopaths, but he was just trying to provide evidence that they might be showing tendencies towards that. They compared that with a control group of 44 non-criminal teens, but who also showed emotional problems, and they wanted to see whether those children had also experienced maternal deprivation. So what they found was that out of, four, out of 44 thieves, 14 of them showed affectionate psychopathy. And of those 14, 12 of them had experienced deprivation in the first two years of life. So this shows that there is definitely a link between prolonged separation or deprivation and the likelihood that they had emotional problems later on in life. So we're talking about, again, the continuity hypothesis that early childhood experiences were affecting how they behaved in later life. Whereas in the control group, two out of the 44 had experienced maternal deprivation, but none of them had turned out to be affectionate psychopaths. So Bowlby concluded that affectionate psychopathy and maternal deprivation were linked. He's providing a correlation with these two things. So if you want to evaluate it, giving the strengths and the weaknesses of it, you might want to think about using Bowlby's 44 Thieves study as evidence for the effects of deprivation. So providing validity that the theory might be correct. However, you can criticise his study and say that there were methodological problems because Bowlby completed the study himself. He interviewed the participants and their parents themselves, and that makes it a problem because he's showing a researcher bias. And therefore, he knows what the aim of the study is, and he's going to try and portray that in his findings, whether unconsciously or consciously. However, the biggest positive is that Bowlby's research had a massive impact on how children were looked after in hospitals. At the time, children often were just left on their own for weeks at a time in hospital um, and were, their parents very rarely visited them. But now parents are allowed to stay overnight with their children for as long as they need to. And that has had a real positive impact on how children progress later on in life because he showed the value of this. Unfortunately, though, when Bowlby's study has been replicated many times, and for example, Lewis in 1954 did a replication on a much larger scale, looking at 500 young people and didn't find the same results. So maybe Bowlby's findings aren't as valid as first suggested. I hope this video was helpful. Thank you.